Good morning, welcome, perhaps good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Regardless, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of the uh, MFRA, which we'll talk about here in a second, on food and nutrition before, during, and after disasters. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. This session is part of the MFLN's Spring Military Family Readiness Academy, which is an annual programming series designed for military family service providers working in any field. Each Wednesday from now through the end of March, we'll be di diving deeper into different aspects of disaster and hazard readiness in action in the context of military family readiness. For more about the MFRA series and to register for future sessions and our workshop, you can visit the MFRA homepage and we'll pop that link into the chat here in just a moment. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or have any other technical difficulties throughout today's session, you can send us a tech support request via email to milfamln at gmail.com. As many of you have already done, we do look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation and for questions as well as hellos. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen and then from there you can select the chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, please be sure to select the all panelists and attendees response option from the drop down menu so everyone can see them in the chat as we go through today. Additionally, if you're interested in continuing education opportunities, stay tuned till the end of today's session. So we or when we'll be talking about available options. Finally, you can download the event materials as well as the uh, resources list that we'll be noting throughout today's session on our event page. And we'll again pop that link here in the chat in just a moment for your reference. It's my pleasure and delight to welcome my colleague and our moderator for today, Ms. Robin Allen. Robin has been a registered dietitian since 1980, and she is currently the program coordinator for our nutrition and wellness concentration area for the Military Families Learning Network out of the University of Illinois. Robin serves as a dietitian in the Navy, and she retired after 34 years as a Navy captain. She received her undergraduate degree in food science and institutional management from the University of Alabama, and then her master's in science in public health from the University of Illinois. I'll now turn things over to Robin to introduce our speakers and facilitators for today. Robin. Thank you, Coral. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to introduce our four speakers, Kendra Zamoyski, Family and Consumer Science Regional Special Agent, UF IFAS Extension, Northwest District, University of Florida. Luann Duncan, Extension Agent 3, Family and Consumer Food and Family and Consumer Food and Systems, University of Florida, IFAS, Extension, Sumter County. Richard Stith, Chief Public Health Division, Dep Department of uh, Defense Commissary Agency, excuse me, Public Health Division. Retired Chief Warrant Officer for U.S. Army after 24 years of service as a Veterinary Services Food Safety, and Kirsten O'Neill, Health and Wellness Coordinator, Defense Commissary Agency, who's also seeking her PhD in Public Health and Administration. The learning objectives for today's webinar is determine healthy meal preparation practices during a disaster during special diet considerations. Identify safe food practices before, during, and after a disaster. Describe the safe handling of drinking water before, during, and after a disaster. State the mission of the DECA's public health team. Explain what the DECA public health team does to assist our stores during emergencies and disasters. Describe how the Defense Commissary Agency's public health team assistance to the stores affects our patrons during emergencies and disasters. Uh, I'm, before I turn it over to our presenter, I'd like to uh, ask this question, and if you could please respond in the chat. What types of disasters have you supported military families through? And you can type your answers in the chat pod.
And please make sure it's all panelists, all attendees and panelists. Because I see a lot of all panelists and no one can see that. All panelists and attendees. Do that drop down menu. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, while you're typing, I will now turn it over to Richard. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as introduced, I am the Chief of the Public Health Division for the Defense Commissary Agency. And uh, some of you may not know that we do have public health um, consumer safety officers within the Defense Commissary Agency. So I want to introduce you to my team here. Um, you see I have a public health officer who is co-located with me here at the headquarters at Fort Lee, Virginia. Also is um, Mr. Uh, CW2 Eric de Guzman and Mr. George Acevedo. Uh, I also have members out west in California, Miss Christina Lewis, one in Europe, CW3 Leo Delgado, and one stationed out in Okinawa who covers the Pacific area. And you can look down below their pictures and see the areas that they actually cover. Um, we're pretty unique as a team because there are only we have the largest concentration of military that work inside of DACA. Now we do have two enlisted advisors, uh, but they report elsewhere. Uh, we're led by an active duty army colonel who is a doctor of veterinary medicine. Um, these are the zone, uh, the commissary is divided up worldwide into areas and zones. Uh, the zones are are sectioned off and within those zones are areas. You can see those by the yellow circles that are numbered. Each consumer safety officer that I have covers a number of these zones just depending on, on how it's divided up. Uh, here's DECA's mission statement overall. Uh, we, you know, we deliver a vital benefit uh, to the military pay system. We sell groceries and items at cost while enhancing quality of life and readiness. When I choose this picture, I'd like to point that out. I choose that picture because at the end of the day, the bottom line is, is um, for my public health team, uh, this, is, this is what we focus on, keeping a smile on that little guy right there, keeping food safe, making sure he's shopping in a safe environment. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the DECA benefit and what that means. Um, basically, it's a it's part of the compensation compensation package of uh, while you're serving on active duty. Um, also, for retirees, um, and more recently, covers um, anybody who has a VA rating of zero to ninety nine percent. Of course, hundred percent is covered automatically anyway, and certain other uh, DOD employees, DECA employees are allowed to shop there, but this is what the benefit does, enhances readiness, improves retention, and um, the last bullet there, providing American products worldwide while ensuring uh, food in a safe way, uh, is nothing like being stationed overseas somewhere way far away from home, especially if you're a first timer, and you get to go into the commissary and buy a little bit of, you know, Americana, something from back home that you wouldn't be able to find out on the economy. So what's our public health mission? Um, now you'll see in here that, um, that we occupational safety and occupational health is mentioned. And the reason for that is along with my division, we also have a safety division, that, which also falls up underneath that active duty colonel. So that ties into that. For our purposes here, we'll just concentrate on the public health piece of it. So my team, they go through and conduct staff assistance visits. I wanted to point that out because unlike regulatory, where they go in and make sure everything is as it's supposed to be, we go in and we do the same thing, but we also provide a step further where we can provide, uh, we, we do training and we concentrate on issues that stores might be having. Whereas regulatory authorities, that's not what they're designed to do. My team, on the other hand, we have full range to go in and do that. And 
pre-COVID, that was the majority of our mission where we were able to travel. So my team does spend quite a bit of time out on the road. Okay, so that's a little bit about how my team is designed, what we do, what our mission is. Now, what do we do during emergency, disa emergency and disaster events? Um, so within the agency, we have an emergency operations center. Within that center is, it's, a, it's called a council. We like to call it a council. And this is chaired by an, an emergency management specialist. Members include um, people from our store operations group, human resources, engineering, public affairs, resource management, safety, IT, and of course, public health. So when do we activate? Initial activation, that's gonna depend, on, that will depend on what the emergency is. Hurricanes, fires, earthquakes, all have different timelines for when they activate. Hurricanes, typically three or four days in advance. Um, the fires that we had uh, out west last year, um, those were, well, we just activated when they started happening and then they carry on through to the end of the event. And then earthquakes, unpredictable, as we all know. You can't predict an earthquake. So when they happen, it's more of a reactionary. So support during an event. Um, so my, my team, we basically act as consultants. Now I sit on the council from a headquarters standpoint. I help with the initial coordination and all information that's gonna be sent out down to our stores. The main focus, though rest with my team members because they have a day-to-day -day communications with their stores. They're dealing with the management. Um, the best example to really give is, you know, during hurricanes or the ice storms that we just had too, because one of the main focuses that we have is we're worried about loss of power because inside the stores that affects your frozen items, your chill items. And with hurricanes, depending on the severity of the hurricane, it can affect dry because some of our stores have in the past flooded. Uh, but we really focus on, on maintain, uh, minimizing losses due to refrigeration failures. Um, another question we, that we, um, we always have to deal with is, well, are there gonna be generators? and which stores need the generators more than the others. Now that does get into a little bit of engineering and logistics, but we do consult on bigger stores, smaller stores, and with hurricanes, I'm sure you've all seen it, hurricanes going in one direction and within a couple hour span, it just decides to take a left turn. Instead of going into New Orleans, it hits Houston. We saw that last year. So there's a lot of things that go in into that. Um, and then we concentrate our efforts down the line based on risk. So fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, we do have sushi, deli to bakery, rotisserie chicken items. We make sure that the management knows to get that stuff out, sell it, because during these events, that's one of the first places that everybody on base goes they hit the commissary to stock up. Now, another important piece of this is a local military public health, and we call them medical food inspectors. Um, they are considered our regulatory authority, but they're provided to us by the United States Army and the United States Air Force. Uh, the Army provides that support for all Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and there's a couple of Coast Guard installations. And the Air Force, of course, they take care of their own. So they're, they're inside the stores, those medical food inspectors. We have constant communication and constant contact with them as far along in the process as we can until you just can't talk to them anymore because they've had to evacuate. Um, they're very important uh, before and then sometimes during the event, 
but most assuredly after then during the recovery phase. Um, they're experts on uh, knowing how to identify high risk items that you know have been through uh, thawing, refreezing, or maybe they're an item that doesn't meet the cold chain, so it has to be thrown out. They're the, our technical guidance on the ground within our stores. So during the event, um, so as I said earlier with hurricanes, you know, the, the EOC stands up about three days before. And this, there's a lot of coordination going on during this time. Uh, usually we're coordinating with the base and their EOCs. Uh, like I mentioned before, generators because of electricity. Um, generators are very expensive. Uh, they cost around, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's somewhere around fifty dollars to $75,000 to get a generator in place. When hurricanes make left turns or right turns, that greatly complicates things because you can't be moving those at the drop of a dime. Um, fires. Fires, um, fires are a little bit scary because there's really nothing you can do. Uh, with fires, you have to just evacuate and then you pick up afterwards. Um, it's a safety thing, of course. And then with earthquakes, that's all reactionary. Um, the teams will, my teams will end up going in and they will coordinate with um, the people on the ground. And if there's damage, uh, that type of thing, especially with refrigeration systems, a lot of coordination with engineering and local public health. So after the event, when you go in, you know, the event's over, so you go into a recovery phase. And this is where we're concentrated a lot on product loss. Uh, we have a refrigeration failure breakdown guide that we go through, um, which is designed to decide which items are safe to keep, which ones we need to throw out. Uh, we also, this during this time, we also rely on those medical food inspectors to help us out with that because my team is very limited, whereas they're at all the commissaries. Um, and this is where my team, you know, I, I sit at the headquarters level, but my team are really the ones that they do the heavy lifting because they're the ones in constant contact with whatever stores are going through that event. Tiger teams. Um, so tiger teams are, is a name that was given by our store operations people. These are teams that um, they, they pack up a bag, grab some equipment, and then they go down and help the store get back on its feet. And those are usually, um, you have computer people, you have um, engineers, sometimes public health goes, safety, and that really is designed to get the store back up, open so the patrons can come back in. Because a lot of times on the base, that's your main source of food and water. So that, that sums up how my team supports the commissaries, which in turn support the patrons during these events. Now, I call these key points my three C's, communication, coordination, and then close the loop. You can't have a good EOC if you don't have any communication. If it's not coordinated properly, you're not gonna get your missions done. And then one of the most important things is, is you can't just get all that going and then forget about it. You gotta come back around and close the loop and make sure that everything is put back as close as close to what it was before the event happened. And there's a photo of our army medical food inspectors doing checks inside of a, a freezer. Uh, pending your questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, please type your questions in the chat pod. And we had lots of different responses from the initial question, fires, uh, tsunamis, uh, is I think that's the same as a hurricane, but twisted the wrong way. Maybe you could tell me different. Um, EOC is Emergency Operations Center. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Richard, do you ever send foods, food out to places that, that are in need? 
Uh, typically from the commissary, it's just all kept right there inside the store because it is a, um, it's a DOD military shopping facility. So we support the people that can come on to the base. And that's, of course, regulated by Congress. So on the outside, um, that's usually handled by FEMA or the Red Cross. Okay. Have uh, any of your commissaries been uh, destroyed during a natural disaster? The last commissary that was destroyed during an emergency uh, was Tyndall Air Force Base down in Florida. I thought so. Uh, we've had some damage in several others, but that was the last one that was pretty much wiped out. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions for Richard? Did you get to see all the... I see... There is a question about uh, training the medical food inspectors have. Uh, the medical food inspectors, um, they come in, they do their basic training, and then they go to what's called advanced individual training. It's held at Fort Sam Houston for the Army and up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for the Air Force. They go through eight weeks of learning how to be a food inspector. And that ranges from fresh fruits and vegetables, seafood, meat and poultry, sanitation, laboratory skills. They learn all, they get, it's not really in depth because of course it's only eight weeks. And then the majority of that happens after when they go to their first duty assignment and they start going through an OJT process. And then there's a question from Rock Island. How do they work with Army Emergency Family Assistance Centers? The, well, um, could you define they, would that be the food inspectors or my team? If it's, I mean, if it's the army food inspectors, I'm not sure. The commissaries, uh, that's what oh, he says. How the, the, com the commissaries, yes. Right, right. Okay, so the store managers, uh, they are, they usually sit on the base, you know, the base operations councils and, and they send representatives over the EOCs. There's a lot of coordination that goes on working with, with uh, some of those emergency family assistance centers. Um, I don't have any, any details on what goes on, but I know that they are a part of it. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard. That was very informative. I will now turn it over to Kirsten. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kirsten O'Neill. I'm with the Defense Commissary Agency. Up there, we have my contact information and then my program manager's contact information. So if you guys want to reach out to us anytime, um, we love partnerships and um, answering any questions that you have. All right. So um, what I wanted to go over today is that we, we at the commissary, we are a DOD jeweled asset because we do go across all branches. So we are consistent um, between commissary to commissary. Um, we have a lot of almost 200 dietitian approved recipes and we have many recipes that actually you can make without, regard, without any kind of power source. Um, we also, as um, Richard said, we are uh, in your communities. Um, here we go. All right, so we have a lot of shelf stable items. And of course, anytime um, you're preparing for a national uh, disaster, it's good to stock up and we have a good variety. Um, all of them are, are, and we have our own uh, private label brand that um, is, uh, helps it be economical as well. All right, um, our dietitian approved recipes. Um, uh, we have a wide variety of them um, and they are all created by a registered dietitian. So they are helpful in able to maintain your healthy eating pattern even through a natural, uh, natural disaster. All right. Um, and uh, I actually lost power last week for a full day. So I actually was able to make some of these recipes. Um, I like to encourage people to check out some of the uh, ones that require no power, because if you are um, if you are in a situation where you do lose power for a significant amount of time, rather than just eating like straight from the can, um, it's helpful to uh, like have a variety. And all of these are available on our website, uh, commissaries.com. And they are um, since we create them ourselves, um, they are royalty free. 
they're in public domain, so you can share them. Um, you have complete permission and freedom to share them yourselves. All right. Um, that's also a good idea. Uh, it's also a good idea to always keep dehydrated milk um, because it'll help fill the role of refrigerated milk and give you some additional protein. Um, canned meat and veggies are also on hand meat, so you don't have to, you know, go into uh, dip into the uh, refrigerator too often. All right, so we um, this is was an incident um, in Turkey where they had a seven day base wide power outage, um, and so our stores had backup generators, and so um, you know they came to the commissary and. Uh, they were able to recharge their devices, you know, during that outage. Um, okay. All right. Um, so we also, uh, so, uh, several of our commissaries that are in areas um, that are uh, vulnerable to hurricanes, they have uh, additional space set aside in the warehouses to house um, water because we do work directly with FEMA and um, are pretty much their source during those times. Um, and if you are a new parent, it's always a good idea to keep um, baby formula on hand just in case, um, just in case you know power goes out and you can't use your water. Um, and then I saw a question about how to uh, make oatmeal without power. Um, that's one of those where you just kind of make it and like let it sit. If you check out the recipe, um, with instant oatmeal, um, it's just, it's the information's in there, but it's just like you put it together with your water or in your dehydrated milk, let it sit for a bit and then, and then you're good. All right, does anyone have any questions? Okay, sorry, I was too fascinated with the uh, overnight oatmeal. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Kirsten. Many veterans do not know that if they have a VA rating of zero to 99%, they are eligible to shop in the commissary. Can, please pass the word when you can. That's from Richard, thank you. Yeah, thank you for noting that, Richard. That was a new, um, that was something new that happened last year in January, um, and it rolled out um, throughout, uh, throughout everywhere um, through the next couple of months. So it did It did take some time and it's still reaching corners. So yeah, please do pass on that information. So Kirsten, I don't know that everyone knows what a fabulous website DECA has. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about what you offer and I see another. Sure, sure. Um, so all of our, if you go to commissaries.com, we have a lot of resources on there. Um, like I said, we have about 200 recipes on there. Most of them are dietitian approved. And all of our recipes that we have there are in uh, public domain. We also have a section where we call thinking outside the box, where it takes one of those recipes and it's usually um, made from center store items and it has nutrition education alongside of it. So um, you can use that, you know, you can use those recipes and help educate on um, nutrition and healthy eating patterns. Um, we also uh, have a number of other resources on there just that you'd find with a normal grocery store, like our rewards card, things like that. Um, but we have a lot of uh, health and wellness content on our, on our website that is specific to the military community. Great. Um, can you use, this is to all panelists, but all panelists and attendees, can you use stereo for cooking and heating? I'm not sure what stereo is. Oh, steno. Steno, okay, thank yeah. you. Sterno, okay, I got you. I thought that's what you meant. So sterno, do you know? I would think that would be a possibility. Yeah, I, I would I guess, I mean, heat source is a heat source. Yeah. As long as you're cooking it to whatever safe temperature it needs to be at, okay. yeah. And, and then, then, go ahead. I, I, I saw the um, I saw the question about um, searching for no power. There isn't a, an ability to search for no power, but every recipe um, I actually went through every single one of our recipes, and what's on that slide are the ones that you can either adapt to no power situations, or um, 
don't require a heat, a heat source whatsoever. So um, they're all in the slide there. So you don't have to search. So um, Ross is saying that uh, they're adding this to their move program resources. Great. And okay, everyone's asking how to sort for no power. That might be a good a good project to take on. Kirsten, sorry, I don't mean to put more work. No, no, that's a really good point. I'm going to take that back to our web team um, and see because we we're working to improve the search function on our recipes anyway. So I'd like to add that. So thank you for that. And Michael says barbecue grills used outdoors work uh, work well for heating food. Michael, can you type that in all panelists and, and attendees? And then I'm going to ask uh, quickly, Richard or, and or Kirsten, is there, um, what effect has the, um, the, the virus, the coronavirus had on operations for DECA? Yeah, uh, this is Richard. So it has had an effect. Um, if you go into the stores, you, you can see that our employees are mandated to wear masks and we do have plexiglass as most other places do at the registers. Uh, we make sure that our deli bakery areas, um, people, you know, do their social distancing. Um, there was a time at the beginning where, and some stores are still enforcing it, where you can go only down one aisle or one way in the aisles. Um, it has also not to a huge extent, but um, there have, as everybody has had, you know, there's been runs on paper products uh, that's normalized. Um, we have, um, we have also um, taken a lot of guidance from CDC on proper cleanup, because that'll probably be another question for sanitation. Uh, there are steps that we've uh, provided training to the stores on how to clean up if there is somebody who was working in the store and was, and was tested positive for COVID um, because and then also uh, our patrons uh, most installations well the president President Biden put out his his policies and now you must wear a mask even if you're a patron when you come in um, except for children on the age of two. And then there will be some exceptions to policy uh, depending on um, the patron, if they have a medical issue. So we have, we have been affected, um, but it hasn't slowed us down. Our, our folks in the stores are some of the, some of the best people in the world. Um, they come to work, they do their jobs and they're there for the military. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Tamara asked if you've had any travel restrictions. Uh, travel restrictions, uh, I got that, that could go in a couple of different directions. So um, here's what I will say. Uh, right now travel is, is doable, but it has to be approved by our deputy director or the director. Um, like my team, for instance, they usually spend 60 to 70% of their time on the road. They're not doing that right now. So we're having to find other ingenious ways to, to take care of, of our stores. Um, so travel is very limited. Um, now, if you're talking about recreational travel, that's, that's, a different, um, that's a different question. And uh, Gail would like to know from YouTube Live, do you have propane resources? No, we do not have propane sales in the stores at this time. I, I know from personal experience that you can hardly find propane anywhere these days. I believe the restaurants are using all the propane um, to have their outdoor seating, but it, it is it has now become like the toilet paper rush. That's a, that's true. <laughs> Pinex 
and shop at? Is that a, that must be a store? I think that they're ref uh, referring to the exchanges. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. They have propane. How? Okay. <laughs> you want to take the alcohol question, Kristen? I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I haven't, uh, to be honest, I haven't been tracking this issue. The last I heard is that it is a pilot in some of our stores um, that are. But beer and wine only, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. only in some, but that, that's about it. That's all I've tracked. It's not really a health and wellness thing for me. <laughs> 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 but at least it's it means that they're not going off post for, for that, which is good. True. So Kirsten, someone is asking, uh, can you please speak on how to find no power recipes again? Yeah, um, so there isn't currently a search function for that, but if you go back through the slides um, that I just went through, um, it actually has lists out all of the ones that, all of the recipes that we have that don't require a heat source. Um, and I will take that suggestion back to our web team to turn that into a search function. Excellent. Okay, uh, we're now gonna move along. I will now turn it over to Luann. Okay, everybody. Um, what ways have you been called upon to assist in the disaster? If you could please add that to your chat, to the chat, we would really like to know what things you have had to do. And we'll try to address some of those things as we move along. You can type your answers in the chat pod. Okay, now they're all starting there to pop go. in. Okay, great, thank you. Looking for donations. I think we're gonna try to address some of these kinds of things with you and would welcome your comments as we get towards the end. Okay, so our objectives um, for this have really been covered at the beginning, but we're really just going to take a look at meal preparation during the disaster. Some of you have already made comments related to that. And we're going to talk about food safety practices during that um, disasters and things that people need to be aware of. And of course, a focus on drinking water. So as part of my job, I work for the University of Florida IFAS Extension, which means I'm part of the nationwide extension program. And in our county, we are paid partially by our county. And 5% of my time is allocated to emergency management with the county office. And so <clears throat> this is a picture of the shelter that our office manages and really runs. They bring in medical staff and security staff for us, but otherwise we do everything else. And this is a picture of the cots that we had lined up here a couple of years ago when we opened up the shelter for um, one of our events. And, and it sounds a little harsh and it takes some getting used to the whole idea, but if you think about leaving your home because of an emergency, um, you don't have a whole lot of time sometimes, as you've already heard, you don't have maybe a lot of supplies, so it's good to have them ready. And when you get to someplace like this, there's not a lot of anything extra. And it's, they call it a lifeboat. <laughs> you know, we're the lifeboat providing security, safety um, for people, but it's a survival thing. It's not a cruise ship. And I know that sounds cruel. The first time I heard it, I was appalled. But now as I look at it, um, the cost of running these and having them up and getting everybody satisfied is tough. So therefore, we really have to help people be prepared that they may know that they have to go to a shelter. They may not. How many people in Texas last week were really prepared for what was coming? How, when was the last time you had a snow and ice storm in Texas? So sometimes you just have to understand emergencies happen and you need to have some things ready to go and be prepared. Now, this is another picture of that shelter before some of the cots were lined up. But the reason I have it, um, 
they've adjusted my slide here a little bit and the picture shows a window over to the right that's missing, but this is at a fairgrounds. It's where we have our county fair sale where we sell um, the animals that the 4-H members have grown. And so it's nothing exciting. It's just a nice big room and um, it has been built according to hurricane specifications. There's a small window over to the right that you can't see, but it's just a basic little service window for food. And I usually get to be the person in charge of distributing food. The foods that we provide are not nutritious. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, I did a lot of peanut butter and jelly on white bread. Of course I wore gloves. That was about the most exciting nutrition we had to provide. And I'm not bashing hostess and I'm not promoting hostess, but I personally have to admit, I didn't know what a snowball was until I saw stacks and snacks of snowballs that had been donated. And that was what we put out for breakfast. So it, it's definitely a lifeboat. So if you're working with people in your community, ways to help them is to know that what is available out in the community. Different um, shelters have different services available. In our county, we have special services. If you are on a special diet, if people can get through to a location to pick up a healthier meal to bring to somebody, they will do that. But obviously if we're in the middle of it, we can't always run off it and pick up special meals. There's also special needs shelters. So people need to know which shelter they should go to. It happens that all of our Shelters are pet friendly and they can bring their pets with them. There's a special location to keep their pets. Their pets cannot stay with them or near their cot with them because of allergies and, and other reasons. But of course, um, in a rural area and we had people show up or at the fairgrounds, they were hoping for their bigger animals. We can really just take cats and dogs. We can't take everything else. We can't take the horses. And there is a location for horses, but it is a trek up the road. Um, what support systems are available for the clients during these times of disaster? What kinds of things are available? Sometimes there's not much, and sometimes it is just this shelter. And knowing if there is dry ice available, where you can get it, do they bring it in certain times of the year here in Florida during hurricane season starts in June? Right now, people aren't overly concerned about their um, backup. And now is the time that a lot of times we're using the supplies in our emergency bag so that they don't get too old. Are there camping supplies available? What camping supplies can you use? And then our MREs available. Now, I would like to verify me meals that are ready to eat or MREs. And they're pretty much meals that don't require water. They're already cooked. They're ready just to eat the way they are. But there are also people who save up freeze-dried meals or dehydrate their own foods. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But... Um, we do have COVID um, precautions. There are hotels locally that if there was an emergency and someone was um, considered to be COVID positive, that they could go to the hotel or if they'd been exposed. Luckily, we were one of the states this year that did not have to utilize that. So I'm not real sure how that worked for everybody. And we don't have that many hotel rooms. Now, as you all know, every time there's a disaster, they show us the grocery stores. Um, you were talking about the propane and the toilet paper when COVID hit, but almost every time when there is an emergency predicted, when they are seeing a hurricane coming, they, people rush to the stores and some of these things are gone and then they can't get water. You see long lines, people waiting outside stores to get water. So really telling people to prepare ahead of time and have supplies on hand, they need to remember to have all their medications, any medical supplies, maybe have extras on hand in their emergency kit, ready to pick up and go in, in case of a, an immediate disaster. 
And it can be costly to do this, which is an issue for many of our families. Um, I've heard some people say, you know, June hits and, oh, I don't have anything in my hurricane kit. So I have to run out and buy everything I need. And that can add up to a hundred and hundreds of dollars. So it's better to just prepare over time. Like I said, we're eating some of the things out of our emergency kit right now, but then I replace them with new things. And adding a couple items weekly to your grocery is a lot easier than trying to buy it all at once. And sometimes you're just not going to be able to find the MREs. Trying to have that cooking equipment on hand. It's great to have some recipes and use some things where you can't cook, but there are some portable types items that you can buy. And once again, it takes space and it costs money. Many of our people need some assistance in planning what goes into that hurricane kit. <clears throat> if you think about it, first of all, they need to understand labels of the groceries they're buying. But you can buy a big bucket of dried food that'll last for years. But what we need to know about is that dehydrated foods over time will provide sustenance and mostly just carbohydrates and maybe some of the minerals that are in there. If people dehydrate their own food to put in their kits, it, it isn't going to hold on to nutritional value for more than a year. So once again, it's that lifeboat. It's going to provide emergency sustenance. It's going to help people in crisis to survive, but it's not a long-term answer, especially for people who are on special diets. And so take that into consideration along with the fact that when a person who was diagnosed with diabetes has a crisis and they're under stress, more than likely their glucose is going to go up. Do they know what to do when that happens? Probably take a little more insulin if they are dependent on insulin, but what other kinds of things can they plan for and do? And so these items that you buy on the shelves that are shelf stable are high in carbohydrates. They might be high in sodium. Usually they don't have very much fiber. And by the time you would use them, they don't always have that many nutrients. So helping people plan it in advance for those meals. Um, she showed you that the commissaries have all kinds of foods to keep on hand, but what are the nutritional values of the, those foods? What kinds of allergies are we dealing with? Um, the people with chronic diseases need to maybe watch for the sodium in, in, in something. Uh, the people who are pre-diabetic or diagnosed with diabetes need to watch for the carbohydrates in the foods. So having those shelf-stable items and sources of protein and their fruits and vegetables to balance out their meals is very important. <clears throat> So it's important to keep all the supplies together, ready to go, grab and go. Um, I use big plastic bins and I have two of them, but they also include some backup fuel. I have the butane burners over here, but what good is that going to do me if I get somewhere and I don't have a can opener to open the can? So making sure that you have a checklist of everything that you might need and have it there and available. If you take it out of the kit to use it for something else, make sure it goes back in and then make sure that you have all the ingredients. If your food is dehydrated, you're going to make sure that you have extra water on hand. And I do have a picture here of home canned water. There's many ways to make sure that you can have water on hand. And we're going to get into that a little bit more, but I'm going to turn it over to Kendra at this point. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Kendra Zamoyski. I'm a regional specialized agent with the University of Florida IFAS Extension. And I am going to share with you today some of the lessons that we've learned, um, particularly from Hurricane Michael, but also others. So I am located in the panhandle of Florida. And about a little more than two years ago, we uh, were faced with pretty widespread damage from Hurricane Michael. And um, 
you know, I think some of the lessons that I'm going to talk about with you today are things that you can apply to many other types of disasters. So uh, one of the things I wanted to share with you uh, is about drinking water. So, so one of the things we find is that people tend to underprepare for the amount of water that they're going to need during, um, before, during, and after a disaster. Uh, people don't always think about the fact that uh, without power, their well may not work. Um, if they're on city water, they might not think about the fact that the, those public water systems might be compromised. Uh, and that could affect their access to water following a disaster. Uh, so we, uh, really, when we work with people and families, we need to really help them be aware of how actually how much water they need to have and uh, on hand. So it is recommended that people store one to one and a half gallons per day per person and pet in the household. So that's quite a bit of water. Uh, and um, if you can and you have access and space, it's good to also store ice. Uh, although if you're faced with a power outage, uh, the storage of, it might not be ice, but it could still be water after uh, it thaws. Uh, so any water that you store from tap water, you're gonna wanna store that or use that within one to two days. Uh, and after an emergency, definitely you want to be prepared for boiled water advisories. Uh, and one of the things that we find when working with families is that they don't really understand uh, how the boil water advisories work, what they can and can't use the water for, and, uh, and how, how they can treat their water so that it is safe. So the recommended uh, process is to boil the water continuously for three to four minutes and then store. And again, you're gonna wanna use that water within one to two days. Um, private, uh, pr you can you do other methods of purifying things. Um, you can purify uh, private well water to store also, but those are some of the recommendations. Uh, so one of the things we really want to help people understand too is uh, how to keep their food safe when they're when they're faced with a power outage and what they can do following an extended power outage or even a short one. Uh, there are tricks that you can um, you can use to kind of determine how long your power may have been out for and uh, what state of uh, condition your food is in. So one of the tricks that we tell people is that you can uh, put an ice cube in a Ziploc bag and put it in your freezer. And then if you're away from home or um, you know, weren't sure how long the power was out, you can pull that bag out of the freezer. And if it is in any state of thaw, then you know that your power was out and um, you might may need to throw the things in your freezer away. Um, a typical refrigerator, if you keep it closed, will uh, will keep temperature for approximately four hours. Uh, a freezer kind of depends on how full it is. A full freezer uh, may keep for approximately 48 hours and a half freezer for 24 hours. Uh, so Luann kind of already talked about dry ice. Uh, dry ice will keep things for two to three days, but I think we need to be aware that dry ice can be hard to access, and um, there are definitely safety precautions that need to be followed if, uh, if that is something that you use for emergency preparation. Uh, so uh, the 2020 uh, year was a pretty active hurricane season for us, and we had um, some issues with flooding. I know this happens in other areas as well as fire. Uh, so um, I think it is really important to help people understand that if they are on a well uh, and they have experienced a flood, that they really need to get their water tested uh, and they need to disinfect 
the well water or the well if it if bacteria is present and until that situation is taken care of their water will have to be purified before it can be used uh, any food that that um, came in contact with flood water needs to be thrown away it, it's considered can't contaminated uh, you can disinfect commercially canned food items, dishes, and utensils, and they all should be disinfected if they've been in contact with the flood. So uh, cooking without power uh, uh, can be very dangerous if it is not handled safely. Uh, so we need to make sure that we communicate mes messages of safety, uh, when people are faced with power outages. Uh, generators, grills, camping equipment, all of that can be very dangerous uh, if, if they're not kept safe, if they're not used properly. Um, so I think even in the Texas situation, we've heard unfortunately about some, um, some issues with sa safe use of generators and grills and that kind of thing that were used for, for heat. Uh, so make sure you follow uh, your food or follow your safety recommendations uh, for even camping equipment when using that inside. Some of it can be safely used inside, but you want to make sure that you're you're following all the safety procedures. So uh, so just sharing some other kind of little food safety faux pas that we sometimes see uh, following hurricanes here in Florida, and I'm sure these kinds of things happen in other places as well. Uh, but we want to be really extra careful with food following a disaster anytime that there has been a power outage or uh, um, that kind of thing. Uh, it is very hard to communicate to people sometimes uh, the importance of throwing food away, especially after a disaster when uh, supply, the supply chains might not be back, the stores might not be back open, telling people to throw food away is kind of a difficult thing to communicate and it's a hard message to hear, you know, especially if you're not sure you're going to be out, able to access new fresh food. Uh, so we do see people you know, wanting to help out their neighbors and, uh, you know, take taking food that probably should be thrown away from their freezer and cooking it up, they, thinking that it might be safe after you cook it and then serving it up to, to their neighbors. And this can make people sick. So uh, we want to um, be aware of that and, you know, cooking Cooking food that is unsafe because of a power outage doesn't cook away the bacteria. You can't make it safe again. So uh, as Luann said, uh, we have extension offices in every county here in Florida and uh, many of our county offices are looked to during a time of disaster to help ser serve in their communities at shelters or um, distribution centers or, you know, we're really called upon to help out in the communities during that time of need. Uh, and, you know, being a family and consumer sciences educators and teaching about nutrition and food safety and all of the things that that we do, we know that there is a definite need for communication about food safety and nutrition um, following disasters so that um, to keep people safe. So like we like we said, So we've lost you, Kendra. Uh, did you hit your mic? While you're getting her back on, um, we could look at some of the questions that came up in here. Excellent. And I, I think that um, some of the things that you mentioned 
we really do want to emphasize, yes, the carbon monoxide poisoning, it seems like every single time there's a disaster, we have, we have loss of life due to carbon monoxide poisoning and people bringing generators indoors, using things too close to windows in their homes. And, you know, especially last week with, you know, the cold and people didn't have access to heat, they were doing things they could. So finding things that are battery operated and that, that you can use it might be helpful. So um, I, I've also lived in the north where, you know, we had ice storms that lasted for weeks on end. And you know, if you don't have that water supply, some people were asking about keeping things in garages. You want to keep your canned goods and your water at your your temperature so that um, if canned goods don't like to be too hot, it can loosen the seal. If they get too cold, it can break the seal. The water bottles are typically uh, not meant to be stored in heat. They can absorb some of the chemicals from some of the plastics. So keep those things in an area that um, is more comfortable for you. Kendra, are you back? I don't know where she went. I hate to do her program for her, but um, basically she has worked in, in some of the worst situations and she's seen these things. And it's really hard to get information out to people because if they don't have a tower, uh, they can't do cell, phones aren't working. There's no way to let people know. So basically go back to paper resources, trying to distribute things to people. Food safety is a very, very critical issue that we deal with all the time. And I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but be careful if you have immunocompromised people, especially um, the food safety issue is very, very serious or can be. So like the oats, uh, the oats that aren't cooked, sometimes there have been outbreaks with products that are whole grains because they're in the processing, those are not heated in any way. And I know people are doing research, trying to see if you can heat it up and get rid of any contamination. But remember these plants are grown in fields that animals run through, birds fly over, and sometimes contamination can happen on uncooked grain products. So think about that. People need food and water and they need, um, information on if and when it's available and how to get to it. I don't know, Kendra, are you back or can you move the slide? I am back. Can you hear me? Yes, go for it. Okay. I'm not sure where, when or how or why I cut out. So uh, if you could give me a thanks for the, the helping hand. Um, is this the slide, the correct slide that we're on? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so I spent some time working in some of the distribution centers and saw some of the issues that um, Luann saw with the snowballs. So, uh, you know, it's really important during these times, communities and people want to help each other. And so, you know, there is, you know, a lot of people that will want to provide donations and businesses that might want to provide donations. But if you can help people think of healthy, uh, healthy foods and um, thing and items that would help make healthy meals, good things to donate. You also don't want things to end up in a trap in the trash following disasters. Um, sometimes not all supplies are helpful because you've got to find a place for them. Um, so consider using cash don donations to rep reputable reputable charities. Um, it's also, I, I've seen a need for training volunteers who are cooking food for groups and nutrition and food safety also, so that um, healthy, safe meals are prepared during these times of disaster. So, and I kind of was quickly scrolling through the chat, trying to figure out when my sound, sign, my sound went out. Um, so I saw some, somebody had asked about resources. So not everybody talks about their resources and references page, but there's really some really good links here that are helpful that we put in uh, for your own use uh, during disasters. Um, our UFIFS extension uh, disaster handbook is a really good resource. We use that a lot um, 
during hurricanes and following hurricanes to get information out. It's just short, simple, uh, easy to read information on a variety of topics from wells to trees to uh, animals, all sorts of things. Um, we also, our disaster website, disaster.ifis.ufl.edu is also a really good resource. Um, we uh, try to keep that updated with links uh, to all sorts of information from agriculture and livestock and animals um, to, to trees and what to do with your boat, all kinds of information there as well. So these, um, you can bookmark these, these references and use them uh, as you need. So I know there's some other really great extension resources um, from Eden, the Extension Disaster Network, has really awesome resources too. So, and are there any questions for us? So there's been quite a few questions that have come in from for both Luann and Kendra, and I'm gonna start uh, at the top. Uh, I think, Luann, this refers to your first slide where you so, showed the uh, center with all the cots. Would love to know how an operation like this was able to be done from Lori. Well, our county has uh, set up the shelters. We have, I believe, five shelters, and each site has a storage area where the cots are that we go in, and then they provide us the materials that we need. So that is done through the emergency management. We don't have to get all of that set up ourselves. Now, if somebody wanted to do something like that on their own locally, I really think they should talk to somebody within their community or the county that they live in and ask if they could be a supplement site and, and if they want to provide something like that, the things that they might be able to get help with. Excellent. Do all states have their own manage, way to manage that? I personally can't answer that. I don't know off the top of my head. Kendra, okay. do you know? No, I'm not sure either. Having come from another state that, you know, had things happen that were on a much more rare occasion, I don't know that the county was highly active, but I believe that they did have resources when something happened. Great. Uh, do you have a list of facilities that will house livestock in Florida? Um, I can see if I can find one. I know the one closest to us, but I'm not sure. And I don't know that you can bring in very much what all you can bring in it's not like you could bring in a whole herd of cattle or anything so I, I'm not sure I'd have to ask about others but for the horses um, it's in Marion County where they have a few facilities because they have some horse racing horses and things there and I right. don't know how many they can accept so I, I saw that question come in while you were talking, Luann, and so mm -hmm. I was trying to look to see if I could find something, and the link on the uh, Department of Ag website wasn't active, so uh, I'm not sure. They might just pop that in, you know, during a disaster when it's close by, because I'm sure that changes frequently, but I would encourage people to reach out to their local emergency center operation. Uh, local emergency management office and, and get that information in advance and maybe find out what the rules and regulations are. And I can't help but think that our county extension agents who are involved with livestock and agriculture may know those answers. Yes, very true. Excellent. So for special needs shelters, Lori wants to know what type of accommodations are made for refrigerated medications being stored alongside of food prep? <laughs> well, I don't know how much food prep is actually happening on the sites, and I have not been in one of the, um, the special needs ones. In our particular location, we had a refrigerator that was allocated for that, and then that refrigerator is backup um, generator. We only had a few things item that, items that went in there, though, because we aren't special needs. Okay. And Pete replied, American Cross tries to provide refrigeration for meds. So that's good to know. And somebody else I think had mentioned within their um, questions about chefs and, and people providing. Red Cross is, has a very intricate system nationwide and they provide food for a lot of these emergencies. And uh, 
I don't know the details of that, but a lot of their food is prepared in huge um, commissaries that are distributed then through them. Excellent. And um, Althea says canned beans and canned tomatoes provide good fiber source just for your FYI to keep in your stores. Absolutely. And Michael says there are wonderful training programs such as CERT community emergency response team that are designated to prepare individuals and groups for disasters. This training is free in most areas for all adults. See ready.gov for more info. There's also uh, extra resources in addition to uh, Luann and Kendra's resources that they annotated as uh, under the material section of your um, at the event page for this. Is it safe to store beverages in cases of water in the garage? I think maybe you already answered this. I did. The store. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jeffrey wants to know where the panhandle is. Florida, is it the Alabama side or the Miami? Uh, the panhandle of Florida is up on the Alabama side. Okay, uh, I've heard people in Texas are using snow for water. How safe is that? I think that, that somebody had mentioned using hypochlorite to, or, you know, chlorine to sanitize. You can also have iodine tablets. I have them in my kit. I'm not gonna lie to you. I hope I never have to use them because it doesn't appear to be very appetizing, doesn't smell good. But when you need water, I would have some of those things on hand in my kit. The snow, you know, if it's built up high enough can be fine, but depending on, you know, like icicles off of houses and things can collect some debris. And then it was also mentioned, you know, that's also a way to keep things cold if you're in the ice. But uh, one of the things we had problems with in the area, and Kendra is going to laugh at me for sharing this, but, you know, um, people put it out in like cardboard boxes, and then you had wildlife come and visit, you need to wow. have that protected in some way. Interesting. So uh, someone mentioned life straws. Have you ever heard of life straws? I haven't. Kendra, okay. do you? I am not familiar with that. I'm going to have to look it up. So it's a, for wa emergency water purification. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that's what they were called, but those things exist out there. There are things, and I strongly suggest people have them on hand because you never know when it's going to be needed. And from YouTube Live, any disaster planning resources or suggestions for hospital food service? Does anybody out there know? I don't have anything. If you do know, go ahead and type it uh, in the chat pod. From Maureen, so it seems that tap water can't be stored long-term. Best to buy gallon jugs of commercially bottled water. Can minimally amount, can a minimal amount of regular unscented bleach be added to tap water uh, so that it is safe to drink? Yes, and if you go, I'm, I'm don't know the site right off the top of my head, and I, but I do believe it's the USDA food safety, or it might be through the FDA where they give the F, those recommendations as to how much to add. I think it is also on uh, one of the one of the references that I put uh, okay. on yeah. the reference slide is safe for handling of food and water, or um, it might also be after a flood testing your well water. Okay, excellent. Has anyone set up a co coalition of professional chefs and cooks they could call upon during disasters to help as part of the disaster planning? planning? Probably don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that's a great idea though. I don't know. Um, my area is you know, doesn't have that many professional chefs, um, you know, they're about an hour away. So I suppose in those areas, they may have that, but where I'm at, we don't have anything like that. And Karen would like to know why you stored water in one to two days. Wouldn't you need to change this out a couple of times per week to prepare for a disaster? What, pe what people do is they, um, when they hear it's coming, obviously, 
you're not going to keep a lot of water that's fresh that isn't sealed in some way and rotate it throughout the year. Yeah, I would keep some bottled water on hand if for immediate emergencies, but usually here we have a warning that it's coming and there's so many different things. There's even a big bag that you can fill up your whole tub. I mean, it's a food, food ready. You can only use it once. It's a, called a water bob. And I think there might be other names for it, but you can fill up a whole tub full of water. And um, that would be the type of emergency water you'd have on hand. Otherwise you'd want it to be sealed if you're going to keep it long-term. Excellent. We've had a lot of responses uh, and information passed along. Uh, there's a, a link from Christy for the hospital preparedness in the chat pod. And Elizabeth shared mercychefs.com for the chefs. And uh, Lori Pete mentioned World Central Kitchens, and I used to be a professional chef. It seems like a good idea. Maybe contact the Culinary Federation to look for a chapter in the area. Good idea. Jeffrey, in Japan, Typhoon filled bathtub toilet for toilet flushing. And JCO also has planning resources for hospital disaster planning. Some great resources have been shared in this chat pod, and I thank you very much, participants. And does anyone else have any questions for any of our presenters? If not, I would like to thank you all, my, our presenters, especially Kendra, Luann, Richard, and Kirsten for sharing all this information and for your expertise. And, and you've been in the thick of things and we really appreciate that. And thank you so much for presenting this webinar and thank you to our attendees for sharing all those valuable resources. We can learn from everyone. And I will now turn it back over to Coral. Thanks, Robin. Another massive thank you to our presenter team today and Robin for moderating today's session. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, today's session is part of a larger series where we are discussing and exploring disaster and hazard preparedness and readiness in action. We invite you to join our next session in this discussion. Uh, it will be next Wednesday, March 3rd, and we'll be discussing preparing for disasters during a pandemic. You can find more about this session as well as RSVP for the session as well on the event page. So as we mentioned today uh, is part of that larger 2021 uh, military family readiness series, academy series on disaster and hazard readiness in action to explore more about all of the sessions we have available as well as the couple that have already passed. Uh, as to where you can find the recordings and explore more information, please visit our MFRA homepage for this 2021 series. In addition to these sessions, we are also hosting one more asset-based community recovery workshop. This is a little bit of a different format. We had one yesterday and we'll also be hosting our final one next Tuesday where you can come join us, converse with us and share your experiences. And so we do invite you to join us. This session is available for continued education opportunities as well. In response to a couple of y'all who are inquiring, uh, yes, today's session is eligible for continued education. We'd invite you to head over to the session page for today where you can find that purple continuing education button. Uh, follow that link and then you will be directed to a survey where you can complete that. Please fill out your best email address uh, and you can receive uh, 1.5 CPEUs for RDNs, as well as a certificate of completion if that is of interest to you. If you have any questions, please reach out via email to Kristen DiFilippo at her email address here on this slide. Finally, the MFLN is host to an entire series and collection of professional development resources, both live and asynchronous. We invite you to explore more about these resources and opportunities on our webpage. Uh, did see a couple additional questions regarding uh, the recording for today's session. Just as a friendly reminder, all of excuse me, um, all of the uh, resources that we touched on today, as well as the slides and the recording, will be available and are currently available on the uh, session page for today. 
and I've just placed that link to the session page for today. Again, that recording of today's session will be available within one to two business days for your reference as well as to share. Uh, and then again, just heading back to this continuing education opportunity slide, please head over and then follow that continuing education button to receive those continuing education credits or the certificate of completion. Thank you again so much for joining us. We hope to see you again next week as we continue our conversation. Thanks again to our presenter team, to Robin, the nutrition and wellness team for hosting today's session, as well as for the amazing resources that everyone shared today. So uh, we wish you a wonderful rest of your week. Stay safe, stay well, and we will see you again soon.